So let's actually practice writing equilibrium expressions for some different chemical reactions. So in the first one here, I've got nitrogen gas, hydrogen gas, and ammonia gas. Well, first thing to point out is these are all gases. Can we measure the concentration of gases? Sure we can. The concentration of gas is actually dependent on pressure and temperature as well. So we could even have more fun with these. But we can increase the amount of gas molecules in a given space, for example, by increasing the pressure. And that changes the rate of effective collisions. So we can definitely use gases in our equilibrium constant. The first thing we have to do for any of these is going to be to balance the chemical equation. So we are going to need, since we've got N2, we're going to need two of these ammonias. And now we've got a total of six hydrogens, so we're going to need three of those there. And now we can go ahead and write the chemical equilibrium constant, the K. And it's going to be concentration of products. So we've got NH3 and then raised to the power of the coefficient. So this will be squared divided by the concentration of reactants. So we've got N2, there is no coefficient there, times H2, and that is going to be raised to the power of 3. So for now, I'm just going to show how to write them. Given the concentrations, you, of course, could calculate this by plugging in the values. Let's try another one. Number 2 has... Uh, I should probably put brackets here so we don't get mixed up between our uh, balancing. SO2 gas plus oxygen gas to SO3 gas, sulfur dioxide and sulfur trioxide. Well, if we want to balance this thing, we've got sulfur on both sides already, but we've got one too many oxygens here, or well, we could fix that by putting a half in front of this oxygen, or we could double everything if we wanted to, but this will... Uh, end up in less exponents in our K equation. So let's do it this way. Again, they're all gases, so we include them all. Concentration of products, in this case, is SO3, sulfur trioxide, and we do not need any exponent there. And the concentration of reactants is going to be SO2 and O2. And our O2 has an exponent of 1 half, and there's nothing wrong with that. Exponent of 1 half you should probably know it's the same thing as square rooting, but it doesn't matter. It works just like any other exponent. I also want to point out that in these K expressions, I did not include states of matter. I didn't include gas or aqueous. Well, there was no aqueous, but we don't need to include them here. It's just going to clutter up our equation more than we really need to, as long as we know that what we're using is something we can measure the concentration of. So like for number three, we now have a pure liquid, and aqueous solutions, and a solid. Well, let's start with balancing it. Actually, the way it's stated, it is balanced, but it's a net ionic equation, so you're not given all of the other things that were included. I'm going to give you some coefficients. Let's say there was three mercuries for every two aluminum three plus ions, resulting in three mercury ions for every two aluminum solid. So what is going to be our equilibrium expression for this one? Well, we've got to do concentration of products. Remember, solids, we cannot measure the concentration. We just simply leave them out. We've got mercury 2 plus ions to the power of 3. That's the only product that we can measure the concentration of. Of our reactants, we have a, a pure liquid. Pure liquid, again, is 100% concentrated, so we can't measure that concentration. So the only thing left will be the aluminum ions. And aluminum 3 plus then has to be raised to the power of 2. And one more of this type. And this reaction is a little different. We have silver chloride turning into silver ions and chlorine ions. So what's actually going on in this reaction? Well, this is basically a dissociation reaction. Imagine taking something soluble, dumping it in water, and now it, it dissociates to form these ions in water. This one's balanced already. Let's see what the equilibrium constant looks like. Concentration of reactants, sorry, of products. We've got silver plus. We've got Cl minus. And that's both of our products. They're both aqueous. We can measure the concentration. If we would try to find the concentration of any of our reactants, we notice we only have one reactant, and it's a solid. So we cannot measure the concentration. That means we have no denominator on this fraction, or it's just one. So 
we simply ignore it and now our equilibrium constant for a dissociation equation is really just multiplying the two concentrations of the products. So that's a very basic practice with equilibrium constants. But of course we really want to be able to solve, solve problems that look something more like this. The equilibrium constant for the reaction of hydrogen gas and iodine gas producing two hydrogen iodide is 50. So 50 is our KEQ at 448 degrees Celsius. I said that uh, KEQ is dependent on temperature, so it's, it has to be stated. It's unique for every temperature. Sorry about that there. Here we have to determine the equilibrium concentration of HI at equilibrium if we have one mole of hydrogen gas mixed with one mole of iodine gas in a half liter container and it's allowed to react at this temperature that we know the equilibrium constant for. Well we already have a balanced chemical equation. Let's start with writing down our equilibrium constant and thinking about what it means. So we need to start with the product on the top. So the concentration of HI gas at, and that has to be squared because there's two of them. Remember these are all gases so they're all going to be included. The concentration of our products is H2 times I2. So this K tells us sort of a ratio of concentrations that this equation likes to sit at. It likes to have a certain ratio of products to reactants, but that's not what we're giving it. We are just simply dumping in one mole of hydrogen gas, one mole of iodine gas, and none of the product. So we're going to let it find its own equilibrium, and this 50 number is going to be sort of the equilibrium that it likes. But how are we going to concentrate, uh, sorry, how are we going to calculate the concentrations that we have at equilibrium? Well, to do this, you're going to have to make what's called an ICE table. An ICE stands for Initial Change and Equilibrium. So here's what that table would look like. And what it's there to do is to give us a good idea of what's going on with each of our entities present. So we're going to start with filling out the initial concentration and then trying to imagine what the change is going to look like. And we're going to use variables that we will solve for in our equation. So let's start with calculating the initial concentrations. So the initial concentration of H2 gas, well, we have 1.0 moles, and that is in 0 0.5 liters. So we've got 2 moles per liter of H2 gas, and well, the other one is uh, the iodine gas is going to be the same. So this is 2, we might as well just say right here, moles per liter, 2.0. This is also going to be 2.0 moles per liter. And hydrogen iodide, well, we start with none of that, right? We start with putting our uh, reactants in and we have no product to start with. So now what do we expect to happen? Some of our hydrogen gas and some of our iodine gas are going to be used up and some of our hydrogen iodide gas is going to be formed. So let's pick any to start with and we'll suppose that X moles per liter of hydrogen gas are going to be used up. So a certain amount is going to be used up, that's going to result in a change of X moles per liter, a change in our concentration. Well based on our balanced chemical equation, the same amount of iodine gas is going to be used up, so that's also going to look like minus X. And then how much hydrogen iodide is going to be produced? Well twice as many moles are produced as are used up of anything else because of our balanced equation again. So this is going to be a change of plus 2x in the concentration of this gas. So the idea is that wherever we started, plus or minus the change is going to bring us to our equilibrium position. So we just basically add these to get our equilibrium. So our equilibrium here is 2.0 minus x for both of these. And here it is 0 plus 2x or just 2x. And now we're going to take these equilibrium values and plug them back in to our equation for the equilibrium constant. So we're going to be basically taking that formula down there. We know the K constant is 50. This is going to be equal to the concentration of hydrogen iodide gas at equilibrium squared. Well, we said that's going to be 2x squared. 
concentration of hydrogen gas is going to be 2.0 minus x and so is going to be the concentration of iodine gas. So now we just have a mathematical equation. If we can solve for x, then we'll plug it back into these other values and we can find what the concentration actually is at equilibrium. So it might seem like we're off into the realm of mathematics, and we are a little bit, but remember the data we're getting out is very useful, very practical. Right? It's literally telling us what will the concentration of this gas be. So let's do some simplification here. This is going to be equal to 2x squared over 2.0 minus x squared. Now we could square root both sides of this equation. So I'm going to square root to 50 as well as this fraction because we've got a squared in the numerator and in the denominator anyway. So the square root of 50 is 7.071. That's going to be equal to 2x over 2.0 minus x. So let's continue by multiplying both sides by our 2.0 minus x. So we end up with 7.071 here times by 2.0 minus x. That's going to be equal to 2x. If we can rearrange to uh, isolate our x, our variable, then we will have our answer. So 14.14 minus 7.071x equals 2x. I'm just doing this equation in all its gory detail. I assume you should be able to solve math equations probably in fewer steps than this, but just to at least give you one complete example here. We'll add the 7.071 to both sides, so now I've got 14.14 is equal to 9.071x. And dividing both sides by 9.071 gives us, to two significant digits, 1.6 as our value for x. So what units did we have on x again? Well, all of the units in this table were units of concentration in moles per liter. So the units here are also moles per liter. That means that our hydrogen gas and our iodine gas changed their concentration by 1.6 moles per liter. They lost 1.6 moles per liter while this reaction reached equilibrium. The question asked us to determine the equilibrium concentration of hydrogen iodide. So we're not actually asked about the concentration of hydrogen or iodine gas. We could calculate them by doing 2 minus this 1.6. What we are asked is for the concentration of hydrogen iodine gas, which we know is 2x, or in other words, 3.1. Uh, just a quick little note here, 1.6 times 2 is 3.2, but um, use the unrounded number. This is a good example of when that becomes important. So 1.6 I had rounded from 1.55 something in my calculator, use that original number so you don't introduce any extra errors. And uh, technically you don't need to round until the very end when we'll round here to two significant digits. So this concentration is 3.1 moles per liter. So just a quick review of our steps there. Make sure you're starting with a balanced chemical equation. Make sure also that you are making the ICE table and you're basically filling in those values into the equilibrium constant equation and solving for x, plugging x back in wherever you need to. Let's try another one, a similar one, where we are asked to calculate the molar solubility of lead chloride in pure water at 25 degrees Celsius if Ksp is 2.0 times 10 to the negative 5. You might be wondering what the Sp stands for. Sp stands for solubility product. Um, so basically that means we're doing a solubility equation and we're given the equilibrium constant for it. As always, start with a balanced chemical equation. So we're starting with lead chloride. Uh, without being given any more information, we'll assume it's lead 2+, plus, which is the, what lead most likes to be. It's in water. I guess we should draw a double-headed arrow because, of course, it's equilibrium, so it's not necessarily complete. And it's dissolving, so we're getting out of this lead 2+. Plus and we're getting Cl minus. Uh, let's balance this. So we're going to need two chlorines, chlorides to balance this equation. 
And next comes our k constant formula. So our equilibrium, con equilibrium constant for the solubility product is going to be the concentration of products over reactants. Products are both aqueous solutions, but as we saw for solubility, the only reactant is a solid, so that does not even take any part in our equation. So this ends up being only our products, which are the concentration of lead 2 plus times the concentration of Cl minus, which needs to be squared. So we'll make an ICE table. This makes it nice and easy because we only need two columns in our ICE table as well. So our table should look like this. Since the two things in our table are both products, we're going to start with an initial concentration of zero for both of them. And we know that some change is going to be added. So if we add some change to our concentration of lead ions, what is going to be the change in chloride ions? Well, it's going to have to be twice as much because there's twice as many chlorides produced in our balanced chemical equation. So at equilibrium, there will be a concentration of X lead ions and 2X chloride ions. So now we can plug this information back into our K equation. And we were given K for a certain temperature. So our K was 2.0 times 10 to the minus 5. This has to be equal to these two concentrations multiplied together, which were just x and 2x, and the 2x has to be squared. Right, so this is following again, continuing our equation solving here. So that means that 2.0 times 10 to the minus 5 is actually equal to, well, 2x squared is the same thing as 4x squared times another x is x cubed. So now we've got 4x cubed. Right, so just to verify what I mean, 2x all squared means you have to square the 2 and the x. So that means squaring the 2 gives you 4, squaring the x is x squared. And then we're timesing that by another x yet. So now what I'm going to do is divide both sides by 4. And then I have to also cube root the whole thing to get x by itself. So cube root. So when I do all that, I get x is equal to 0 0.0171. Again, it's a concentration in moles per liter. So that means, once again, that the x that we were looking for is equal to 0 0.0171. That's the concentration of lead ions when we're done. The concentration of chloride ions, of course, would be twice that big. And we were asked for the molar solubility of lead chloride. So molar, sol molar solubility means uh, what would be the concentration if one mole dissolves? And we found the concentration of lead, 2 plus, as a product is going to be 0 0.0171. So what is going to be, or what would be the, the molar solubility? Well, just as many moles of lead chloride had to dissolve in order to make one mole of lead 2 plus. So those concentrations will be equal. So we can say that the molar solubility of lead chloride, and let's answer to the correct number of significant digits, is 0 0.017 moles per liter. So these types of questions might seem a little intimidating at first. I hope that with the process we've developed, especially the ICE table, and using that in our mathematical equations will help us to be able to solve some of these on our own.